Before we go any further, this podcast is brought to you by JN Hair. JN Hair have a fantastic hardware store and also offer plant hair. They also do a fantastic embroidery service, which we use here at PSA to get all our training gear badged up. Hit them up on Facebook, which will be linked in the description below, and contact them for any more information you may need. Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 4 of the PSA podcast. Tonight we're delighted to have a man with us who has played at the top level in this country before securing a move to one of the biggest European sides there is in Rangers and also coming back from Rangers to have a very successful Irish league career. We're delighted to have Lee Feeney on the PSA podcast tonight. Pleasure Matthew, thanks, nice to be here. Well we have a lot to get through so we're just going to get stuck right in. I want to take you back Lee just to your early playing days. Uh, What what players did you look up to? What team did you support? You're talking 25 years ago now, or 30 years ago. Believe it or not, there's there's times in my career there, two, three, four years ago, playing football, I can't remember. But I do, come back, I'd probably playing football at an early age, it was in the street, come back, because you never had the facilities or opportunities now you have. Um, but going back as a 12, 13, 14-year-old, I was fortunate we had a decent-sized back garden. My dad was built a set of nets for us Me and I had a brother who was roughly my age and, and was a good footballer so the two of us grew up together and then we started as I say in the back garden playing then the first official football team I think I played for was probably under 15s my, my dad here started Kilkeel youth team and it was under 16s at the time so I think we're in a league with eight, eight, it was a local league with eight teams with Frele and Newcastle um, down Patrick things like that there Alan Long was in it it was really really good good experience for us so as I say it was a, an opportunity for a lot of us at that age 15 some 16 14 getting an opportunity to play a, an official 11 to say a game because we'd never done it and it's not now now around this area you have so many teams kids mm-hmm. have great opportunities but at that time we didn't have it so that 14 15 was when I first started playing in a proper game um and I can remember it better than I can remember maybe 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, it was great, grow- a great childhood I had. So at what point in your early days did you kind of realise, you know, I'm quite good at football, maybe I want to push myself on? Or did you always have that desire to, to push yourself on? Or were you just happy to just to play and just see what it took you? Um, growing up, again, in our bedroom, my brother we had poster of all these footballers and um, premiership, you used to buy the match and four four two. All these magazines, we, we loved it, and you always dreamt of of being one of them. And something inside, and I'm not telling any lies here. Something inside always told me that I could be this. And I, you probably asked the question. You asked the question there. When did I start thinking I could do it? Mm-hmm. Never really, but always had a wee inkling that maybe I could be one. Um, when suppose. When I was playing for the my dad's under sixteen team, I was I was, just, I was fifteen. Um, Limfield, my dad had actually like my dad would not um, bring the scouts down unless he thought it was good enough. So he brought like uh, a fella called Joe and Katie, he was a Ranger scout and Limfield scout. So he came down and he just thought it was a bit short of Rangers. But he says I'll send him up the Limfield. So once I went up the Limfield, I was straight in the under sixteens, and I think it was then when I, I maybe scored two or three in the first game. Uh, I me- remember walking away and uh, all these Belfast ones, me a wee country boy, got in and they the respected me, which you have to earn respect mm-hmm. when you go up to Belfast. So when you're walking away from the pitch and the boys are coming up, shaking your hand and, and saying, Lee, well done, then you sort of start going, right, Linfield's one of the best youth teams here. I've come up, I've done well. Maybe let's see where the next game takes me and the next game and it sort of went like that. So I think that's when I started to believe I was a, 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 probably a decent player. Um, when I sort of started maybe believing maybe it could be something at that time it was probably an Irish league footballer was, I was thinking mm-hmm. I could be So that was Linfield so you were about 15, 16 years of age 15 to 16 yeah And um, then how long did you kind of stick around there or was there another move or Well it was an interesting story because I was playing for Linfield under 18s and I got kicked up within about 2 months 15 nearly 16 in the under 18s and I was playing there every week, doing really well. But then we came to an Irish Cup game and the under-18 level. So what happens is all the better under-18s that are playing for the Linfield Swifts, which is the reserves, 
go downstairs to play in the big game in the 18s. So then that was me so kicked upstairs, they call it. You're the better players are playing this weekly, you're away with the Swifts, away somewhere. So I went away with the Swifts, I scored a hat trick then in my debut. So then they kept me on. So then that was the next step. Mm-hmm. So I played there for three months, then Trevor Anderson brought me into the first team. So I got a taste of the first team. Uh, one game, I've done a few subs. And then I started, the, my dad sort of said to me, look, Lee, forget about Linfield. You need to go somewhere to try and play first team football. Mm-hmm. And that's when I left, when I was just turned 17. And at that stage, as a 17-year-old kid, you know, getting a taste of, of, of first team action at probably one of the biggest clubs on, on the island. How did you feel in that situation? Did you feel this is for me? Or did you feel out your depth? Or did no. you, you know, did you have a want for more of it? Or? Well, when I got the first um, taste of it, it was actually against Glen Torn in the midweek match, the quarter final of the League Cup or something. But it ended up, I come on after 25 minutes, it got abandoned. And then, because of bad weather in the 70th minute. But at that time, I feel a fantastic squad. They had boys from England flying over Scotland, flying over. They had a lot of people, players from down south. So it was just good to be there. But thankfully, my dad guided me mm-hmm. to go to Ards because you get a lot of kids nowadays they just want to be part of the club and wear the track mm-hmm. suit and this and what have you but sometimes it's better to take a step back and that's what I did and it was I got a full year of playing premiership football with Ards at 17 where mm-hmm. I maybe would have got one or two games with Linfield mm-hmm. so ironically Linfield bought me back a year later from Ards so it's a bit of advice and obviously you do need the guidance from your parents or if if maybe your parents not into football um look at someone and come and ask questions to someone or if there's any kids listening um go and ask someone who's involved in football and ask for a wee bit of advice or guidance what you should do because that definitely changed me definitely definitely changed me for the better so that year at Ards then uh premiership football were you playing every week were you starring in the team were you stand out how, yeah, how, did, how did that year go? I could almost see, I had Roy Coyle as manager and I had a fella, Remy Morrison, who played for Glen Torn, won everything, was at the end of his career, a fella, Barney Bars as well, played for Northern Ireland and, and Glen Torn as well, won everything. So they guided me, I was in midfield with them too. Um, and then I started to shine, I really, really did and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tell a lie on that and I started to really, we were fighting relegation and when you see some of the senior players looking at you to maybe... Um, try and win them the game or try and help keep them up and that's when you it's amazing mentally what it can do for you and how it can drive you mm-hmm. and I felt at 17 I was untouchable uh, playing in that league albeit we were bought in the league but when I was playing I really really looked forward to getting into the pitch and, and I, I knew I could do something and make a change but as I said people around me helped me So then back to Linfield was that something that you had in your head or were you happy at Ards or did you jump at the chance to, to get back to, to Linfield again? What happened was Roy Coyle was at, at Ards and Roy Coyle had left to go to Glen Torn, manager. So straight away Roy Coyle phoned me to go to Glen Torn. I had my heart set and going to Glen Torn. It was football. I was ready for it. Mm-hmm. Um, next David Jeffries phoned me. He had just took over Linfield. So he got in touch with me straight away. Um, asked me to come to Linfield. So within a four or five days, my head was going back and forward. So I had one more game to play for Ards. Um, and I says, I'll have a think about it. And just as I was travelling up the road to play in that game, I remember it during the week against Crusaders, David Jeffries gave me one last call and probably sweat it. Um, just before the game then, I, I went and agreed to go to Linfield. Uh, it was what, amazing. What did, what did he say to, to sway you? Just, he was like, it, it was probably, I was naive too. He was saying, look, Lee, your family's all Linfield. It's You've been here before. You know the club. Things like this here. Um, I played under Roy Coyle, who was a fantastic manager. I learned so much of him. I still have a, a lot of respect for Um And just, it was, as I said, for three or four days, it was going to Glen Torn and then when David Jeffries made that phone call and then the last phone call that, that source turned the tide so um, I've no regrets of that either so I don't I just it was a great option to have Linfield or Glen yes, Torn at that time it was a good uh, chance to pick between the two, yeah, yeah. two probably the two best clubs yeah. at the time and, and it the was company. amazing because when I played that game the last game 
it was against Crusaders and it was up against Glenn Dunlop centre back and he knew I'd signed for Linfield and like I hadn't really signed but he had just said to me I heard you sign for Linfield during the game mm-hmm. I was just how long I'm playing a game here yeah. doing everything he could to put me put off because like, yeah. he had a lot of experience playing uh-huh. but he he found out I think more quicker than most of everybody else mm-hmm. so back to Linfield and, and performances must have been good things must be going well because things obviously escalated and, and a move yeah. elsewhere came again it was a lot to do with David Jeffries breeding confidence into me. What was David Jeffries like to, to play under? Brilliant. He was, he was, he was, he'd be a better manager now, obviously over the years. But when I was there, he was a. What I liked about him was he would ask the senior players for advice, and he would turn around during games and he would admit it and made mistakes, and he would have been sitting there and he, what do you think the likes of Noel Bailey and and we had Stevie McBride there, we had Alan Dornan, we had. Um, we had Jeff Spears with tons of experience and David Jeffries would have sat in that change room and left it with an open mic what do you think which I thought was brilliant um, but what he did say what he did was give me a freedom to go out and play and mm-hmm. made other players maybe do jobs where I hadn't I'd just get the ball and go and express yourself and he, he highlighted that before every game for me to go and express myself and as I say he breathed confidence into me and again it was for the mentality he gave me was it was great. I really enjoyed playing under him the and first time. It was a successful time. First time, very successful, and within I think a year again. I didn't even get to see the year out with Ards. I went to Limfield and didn't even get to see the year out with Limfield. I went to Rangers in, but at that time I had a few options. I had Sheffield Wednesday come in, Everton come in, David Moyes at Preston. They all put offers in, mm-hmm. but what's where it was for Rangers was. They had to at that time. They had to have two under twenty ones on the the bench in every first team squad. Mm-hmm. So I thought it was a better chance for me to maybe progress get into involved. the seniors, get involved in yes. the seniors. So I think that was why I chose Rangers at that time. So how did that move kind of come about from Linfield to Rangers? Well, it was obviously word gets about scouts, what have you. A, a lot, a lot of things that help in this country is the the press. Mm-hmm. Um, the, 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 they were fond of me because of the way I played and they would have had me in the newspapers every week doing things and um, it's hard to it's hard to go unnoticed if you are a scout you maybe pay attention to it so I think I had a few scouts come over um, watched a few of the games and um, like anything if any if any club's going to make an offer for a player they need to bring me see themselves but I remember the Tuesday night I was playing and, against Glenavon and um, Rangers sent over the chief scout and the assistant manager Bert Van Lingen to watch the game and I can remember it clearly and um, Linfield stuck me in centre midfield that game and I, I sort of didn't really play well but I kept the ball and my dad gave off to me the whole way home he's going you never you've lost your opportunity you <laughs> you, you, you never expressed yourself you never do what you always do you should be shooting trying to score take it round players I said daddy I had a job to do there I was, I had to be disciplined in midfield for the sake of the team um, if they're good scouts, they'll see that themselves, and mm-hmm. thankfully they did. They did make an offer for me at that, that, that time. So when you say there you were playing in midfield, was you usually would have played just in front of the midfield, in front or in, in a, behind the strikers there. So in the, in the free in the wee pocket there, where you sort of didn't really have any responsibilities. Mm-hmm. You were you weren't picking up, or you didn't really have to track back or man mark or what have you. You know yourself and. Yeah. Um, that helped me express myself, but also equally enjoyed playing centre midfield because I was starting to mature and I loved getting involved in the physical side of it, making tackles, getting tackled. Mm-hmm. I really loved people tackling me, believe it or not. I loved getting whacked and picking myself up to the ground and going, I enjoyed that there. Um, and then the responsibility side, the challenge of you having to do your job in defence as well. And you're in respect to that way and I enjoyed, I enjoyed that part of it as well. So you say you had a few offers on the table and Rangers was the one you ended up choosing. Was that a kind of a, a boyhood club? Did you follow Rangers growing up or was, yeah, yeah. was that part of it or was it just sheerly down to the, the fact that you've seen Rangers as a chance maybe to get more minutes or to get closer to first team action? See, so yeah, I had but another thing was I was playing for Northern Ireland under 21s at the time and any time I was uh, stuck in a room, it was I was with some of the Rangers boys with Paul McKnight, Darren Fitzgerald. There was room with them, and I've, I grew a, re- a relationship with them. And then Rangers offered me over in trial for the week. 
because they were that serious in making the bid. This is after the they scouted it. So they brought me over um, and then they, they stuck me in digs with Paul McKnight and Don Fitzgerald. So I, I, I got a relationship with them. So then when I come back and David Jeffries called me in the office and he says, there's all the offers you have there and there's how much the teams have offered. Um, he says, I'm not going to, some offered more than others. And he says, I don't care if they've offered double than them. You pick where you want to go. Mm-hmm. And I says, I'll have a think about it. But um, as I say, I was never a big Rangers fan. I just followed them. Mm-hmm. I was I went over a few times to the games, but when I went over there on trial that time, and we were changing in Ibrox and everything, I just looked around me and went, I remember doing this tour when I was 14, 15 with Linfield under 16s, um, going about it, amazed by everything, and there I am, I have an opportunity to be here. So I think that was a big thing too. My mind was clouded then eventually to go to Rangers because of maybe all the, the past, the previous. Mm-hmm. So... Playing at Linfield, you're obviously training two, three nights a week. That's it, yep. Going to Rangers, big move for you. Full-time professional mm-hmm. football, training probably every day of the week. Yeah, yeah. How did you adjust to that, or how did your body and how did your mind adjust to, to, to playing football every single day? Yeah, it's... the re- Well, the reckon was um, when I first assigned in January, and there the, was a winter break then, so Rangers contact me and says, look, you have to report at fly into London, you're going to Florida for two weeks to the warm weather training camp. I says, or 10 days or something. I says, right, that's no problem. So flew in there, straight in the room. Yes, there's someone all, when I went into the hotel in the airport. So what we're doing was flying into London. And then the boys in Scotland were flying to meet us in London mm-hmm. that next day. And then we're all flying to America together. So the ones that were coming back from their winter breaks were all meeting in London. So stuck me in a room straight away, I walked in the room, who was laying there, Andre Kincelskis, who we all know was a legend, I grew up watching him all the time, I actually think me and my brother had a poster of him in the room, so I walked straight in, there's Andre laying in the, in the bed, how are you, Big smell. I knew him from the trial, so um, we flew out to Florida, done the warm weather training camp, played a few friendlies, really enjoyed it, come home, um, Avocat threw me on straight away, in, in the first game back against Dundee, mm-hmm. Um, made my debut so then what happened was the under 21s were going to Chile for two weeks in his warm weather training camp so Rangers sent me there as well <laughs> so four week holiday, what ha- yeah so what happened was if the first game I was playing brilliant I can remember it in the Cola Cola Stadium in Chile playing brilliant against PSV Eindhoven and I, I pulled my calf muscle um, just after half time pulled my calf muscle proper done damage mm-hmm. Um but the reckon what happened was I wasn't used to because I was straight in the warm weather camp. It was like a mini pre-season and then I was straight in the chilly doing the same. Mm-hmm. So as you say, part-time, my body wasn't used to it. Just too much too soon. Pulled yeah. my calf and I was out for over three months. And then that's what, once I was out, then Avocat was signing more centre midfielders, mm-hmm. throwing the checkbook about. Claudia Arena come in. Christian... Um, Nurlinger was it midfielder brought on all these players anyway and, and that was me down the pecking order even more so it was harder for me to get back in but that, if that's part of football mm-hmm. that's but that that was a problem for me from part time to full time and you say uh, Dick Avocat was the manager at the time yeah so Dick, you, you were signed uh, from Linfield Rangers as a first team yeah player. First so you team. were working with Dick Avocat training with the first team yeah yeah straight and what was it like I was, you know, going to work every day with them. I was never phased. I really wasn't. There were some great people, some great um, players there, as in made you feel welcome. As as I say, I was already broke in with Paul McKnight there. He was flirting with the first team, and when I was there, I was living with Scott Wilson as well. He was in the first team squad, so I had had friends. I'd, like I had already built up relationships. You had players like Arthur Newman. Would have made you feel welcome, Rickson, um, Fernando Rickson, brilliant. Um, so they made you feel welcome. Um, no, I wasn't phased one bit. As I say, when I seen Andre lying in the bed, surprisingly, I was like, "All right, Andre." I was, I wasn't. So no, I wasn't phased. I think, I think that was one of my my strengths. Was I never got overawed by anything, mm-hmm. or never by um, shocked or shell shocked or whatever you would say. Um, I've tried to take everything on board. 
So your calf injury out for a few months, pretty much right at the start of your your Rangers yeah. career, which wasn't ideal. You recovered from that, and how how did things well, how did things is, go after well, that? Well, this is it's it's no secret. Like my my attitude wasn't the best. Um, I didn't have the hunger. I wasn't fighting to try and get my place back. Um, sort of feeling sorry for myself. Going about football didn't become important to me. Um, I just I just um. I don't think I was mentally strong enough for the challenges that was there, and I took things for granted. And I was a laid-back character. I was, uh, I was very country coming down from the country. Everything never fazed me, as I say. Everything was um, easy come, easy go, and all. And I never really pushed myself. Never challenged myself. I went to training, couldn't wait to get home. Last end the training, first home. Um, when I'm leaving training, you see some of the the. the, the Boys, the internationals, like as I mentioned, a few Newman, and then you've George Alberts, and all their way to the gym doing a wee bit extra out right in the training ground. Where I never done that, I couldn't wait to go home. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, it's a regret now, um, but I went over there. I don't think I was mentally prepared or, or mentally strong enough to go and give it everything I had. Talent wise, I did have it, but my, my mentality never matched my ability. and. Uh, that is probably a big regret to have from, but I use it now. I use it now for uh, in the management. So that was just recovering from an injury, and you never really, never really broke back in, or you never really got back into where you were just slightly yeah. before your injury. As I say, I went down the pecking order, and then my mind wasn't right. I didn't push myself. So Rangers come up with a solution to try and refresh me and try and um, give me a fresh start. So they sent me over to Australia, though, and they. The first week then I went and dislocated my elbow out there. I was out in tour with Rangers. I'd signed a contract and we're playing against the Australian national team, the friendly, uh, uh, and just I fell, shattered my elbow, smashed it. So it was it was in a bad way. So I had to get surgery over in Australia um, and then come back to Glasgow and then fly out there for eight months loan or six, seven months, the rest of the season. Mm-hmm. There was six months left the season. And I was out for four months doing rehab. And my first game back, I got sent off. So they were waiting on me, all the fans and everything else. Just saying from Rangers, he got injured in the way over. Supposed to be a bit of potential. And um, I come over and I get sent off after 15 minutes. Where was, that I, just, I, was that just eagerness? Was no, that eagerness? it wasn't. I shouldn't uh, even sent off. It was like, you know yourself in football, the fullback gets the ball, hits it down the, lay, the line, the striker comes in to close the ball. And the, the the defender left his leg up, and then swung round and dived as if I'd come clobbering into his leg. Mm-hmm. Straight away, the ref didn't hesitate. Red card, so that was me out, and we didn't make the playoffs. So I think I think I played one and a half games out there. <laughs> so that was another failure, um, another failure there. So it was so. As I say, I was getting injured at wrong times, and 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 then making silly decisions at the wrong times, but. You can, when you're young and you're you're inexperienced, that's expected. Mm-hmm. So, do you think maybe um, life outside of the pitch had an effect on on how your life on the pitch went? Definitely, definitely. As I say, my character, my personality, I'm very laid back. I wasn't phased. I, 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 again, I didn't see things around me. What I should be doing? What I can see now? Maybe as a player, what I should have been doing? Push myself, doing the MRs in the gym. Doing the MRs in the training ground, extra. Um, just I didn't have the desire, the hunger. Um, definitely off the pitch. Um, didn't help me on the pitch. Uh, there's no, there's, it's, it's not a secret. And I, I don't shy away from it because I think it's made me the, the person I am today with um, the experience I have of failure and bouncing back again. And, and I, I'm not ashamed of it at all. Like, so that was Rangers then came to an end. Was that uh, a personal decision or were you were you no, told was, that? No, I was I was told I think Avocad left and um Alex McLeish came in there. And, and did, he, away. did he give you any opportunity or No, it was it was sort of uh he was trying to get he I think that guy Avocad had maybe spent a few quid too much. <laughs> um so he had the balance of books and get rid of maybe dead wood and try and Develop the youth what he had which he ended up did Alex McLeish done a great job when I left there he he, had, he brought in all the young players like Alan McGregor Bob Malcolm Morse Ross Stephen Doby 
um, Stephen Hughes, they were all boys that played in our under 21s for years, maybe sat on the bench. When I played, they were my apprentices and all when I was playing. I think maybe if Alex McLeish, that situation, um, came in two years or a year earlier and maybe give me a wee bit of hope, mm -hmm. I think maybe things could have been different. But then that's what we all say. But no, um, it was mutual. I had, they weren't renewing my contract. So, but at that time, Oldham had offered me a contract. Oldham, Ian Dow was manager. And Rotherham United, I think, had offered me a contract. But Nationwide pulled out of the funding or the the sponsorship for the English League. So it just, just collapsed. All the money left. Mm -hmm. So then Oldham offered, said to me, come up and trial. I said, I'm not going on trial. Rotherham offered me on trial. Doncaster was the other one. So these two clubs were offering me trials. I was going, why, why would I do a trial and come from Rangers mm -hmm. again? I didn't know any different. So I took the easy option, went to Linfield. How do you look back on your days at Rangers? I loved it. Uh, I just, especially when I first went there, um, when I first went there, I felt really good. I felt fit. As I say, when I started getting injured, losing the, the last year and all, I felt, I just didn't want to be there. I was I, I was playing too long in the under 21s and I needed to go, they wouldn't loan me out. Um, and I just didn't really enjoy it. But um, no, I really I learned so much there. Played with some great players, met a lot of friends. Um, I've, I've still got that in my memory, so I can't take that away from mm -hmm. me. Very good. So time at Rangers was up, and um, probably didn't fulfil your full potential. No, definitely didn't. But then mm -hmm. uh, I moved to to Linfield back home again. Yeah, again, come home to Linfield, expecting things to just happen for me. Uh, again, I didn't push myself, work hard, um, not doing myself any favours off the pitch. Um, and as I say, it was inevitable what was going to happen to me. Me and Davey parted ways, mutual consent, we were still good friends and he, th he thinks a lot of me and as do I of him. But um, again, it didn't work out for me and I just didn't, I just wasn't... I just felt everything was going to be easy come from full time to part time and I wasn't mm -hmm. playing well and I was getting frustrated myself. The big thing was I wasn't fit. I kept making excuses and, and pointing fingers and blaming this, blaming that when it was all down to me at that time. And again, perhaps now when I look back on my career all over them years, I'd never had a father figure who would give you guidance. When I hear stories with Alex Ferguson there, all his kids like gigs and... Um, Lee Sharp and all, all them boys, he used to call their digs, make sure they were mm -hmm. looking after themselves, weren't going out. Um, I think that's important nowadays in football. I really do. I think the younger generation needs a bit of guidance. They need, they need to understand how important it is to work hard, do that bit extra, be fitter than the person you're playing against. Um, just them simple things. Stay away from pubs, nightclubs, drinking beer, all this here, because it doesn't work playing football. It really doesn't. Um, and I think that was missing in my career, definitely. A, a simple bit of guidance at them clubs, I, I would have maybe done a wee bit better. So that was kind of the second stand at Linfield was kind of over. Just on that, being from being from Kilkeel and playing for Ards and Linfield and you know having to travel so much and things like that, how did you cope with that, that side of it? Because it is, living in this area, you are kind of in the back side of the war, as are. people say. You look at the map and we're right at the very bottom couldn't go any further the location is it's an order to get anywhere location's poor but i don't regret living here but uh, it's for the likes of young kids and especially their parents it's challenging for you to maybe push your kid and I, I know you can get lazy you could get lazy and say my kids at linfield have to drive down you're coming home from work you have to take your 14 year old down to linfield or glenavon there's a lot of kids going to glenavon from this area mm -hmm. And it's as I say, it's it's tough. Commit it's commitment, but you have to do it. You, the, the, I'd say the worst thing a parent could feel is have regret that they didn't maybe perhaps give their kid that opportunity to maybe try it at Linfield or try it at Glenavon. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with going down there to Glenavon, spending a couple of months at it, and and then maybe failing as a fourteen year old kid because yes, it can shatter them, but it's a good test of your character. You bounce back, you go again to another club. The, the amount of premiership players that are playing now have had so many setbacks. Like Jimmy Vardy, you look at there now, 
Um, he's been to so many clubs, got knocked back. Like my wee man, there is ten now. If I ever thought he was ha- decent enough or ready to go and play at another club that would help develop him and maybe give him a chance to play Irish league, there's no way I would hesitate in doing it because my dad did it for me. My dad actually. He had no car for an hour, or for an hour for a year. He had no car, and we got the Ulster bus down there in the morning times, seven, eight in the morning, played up in Belfast, eleven o'clock in the morning, straight down the road and played for Valley Seniors. At that time, you could play for play for both. Play for both. So I was coming straight down the road. Then after playing ninety minutes for Linfield, then playing for Valley Rangers, um, seniors. Then at that time, um, but again, a lot was down to my dad. Uh, even when they pushed me, there was days I was going, Dad, I couldn't be bothered. You're you're going and that's it. And him maybe lying sleeping on the sofa because he's just home from work for half an hour. Mm-hmm. You're going. It would have been tougher on him more than me, me lying about the house. But you have to give your kids a push. There's nothing wrong with me. Um, I remember my, my cousin Warren was telling me there, funny enough, last week, he was going to Chelsea every week. He was a, he was a kid at school and he was flying over to Chelsea every in the weekends and in the holidays. And he, he turned around to his dad one time and said, Daddy, I don't want to go. And his dad says, if you if you don't go, you're not coming back in this house again. And, and pushed, made him get onto the flight. Yeah. At that time, at that time, that was a thing you don't think. Now, things are a bit sensitive now and you can't really maybe treat kids that way. But mm-hmm. there, there's nothing wrong with a wee push and a wee bit of guidance and a, and a wee bit of make, them, make that decision for them. And as I say, it's 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 tough on parents down this way because there's a lot of talent and a lot of ability down at this part of the world. And I've I've often thought about maybe trying to do things and try and get a wee academy or structure to try and help develop kids and push them on in this area to maybe go and play definitely Irish league because there there is a lot of ability as I said. But location, location, location. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, it's it's, it's we're a just, difficult one. Isn't it, it is. It is. So you said your time with David Jeffries and Linfield is part of ways. At that stage then, you know, things aren't going overly well for you. You say you're not fit. You're not maybe enjoying football the way you were before. Offers come in. What yeah. Kind of, what was your next kind of thought? Or Ballamina. Was next... Kenny Shields at Ballamina straight away on the phone and then Ards on the phone straight away. Look at me back. So, um, Ballamina was a bit far again where I'm living. Not that Ards is close, but... It was closer, so I chose ours. Went there again. They were they were building a the project. They had uh, they came across a few quid to sold their ground, and they were trying to sign all the. They were saying a lot of players come from England and Scotland, and they had a really good squad. And I think we we're challenging for the league there at one time for seven eight months. We were challenging for the league, so I went there. Chose to go there, which was good. Um, but then again money started running dry there and not not that I was worried about money but sort of ours were struggling to pay a whole lot of players wages some of the boys that were maybe in higher wages so they were looking to offload some of their higher paid players so that's when I went to Glenavon on loan um, and my contract then I seen my contract out at ours um, and then I ended up falling on my feet as I should say because I ended up getting into full time football again with Shamrock Rovers mm-hmm. Um, so I went down there for a season and again that club ended up going bust <laughs> so it happened there's a couple of clubs I had in my career where financially the uh they, they struggled when I went there but um I had a good year down there as well full-time football again um I, I, I did often turn around saying to myself I'm lucky to be here to get another crack at full-time football again but mm-hmm. then again that that didn't develop the way I hoped it would um I didn't get playing as much. I didn't feel it was. I, I, I wasn't so much attitude. I just, I wasn't working on my fitness enough. Um, I come home anyway because the year contract run out there, and then played a half season for Bangor in the championship. Just on the on the Shamrock Rovers, what what do you think the differences was between football up here and football down there? Because uh, it's often a debate. It you is. Know, what's stronger, full time or this or that? Yeah. I think. It's a tough one. There's, there's no, there's no doubt about it. The League of Ireland would be slightly stronger because of the full time mm-hmm. aspect. Um, but I think the teams up the north here with the heart to have mm-hmm. and the desire and the, the, uh, the, the characters and the personalities and some of the teams up here when they do go down south and play like they're not overfazed. They're, they're, 
they, they, they'd stand up to him Isaac's eat Shamrock Rovers the year Linfield won the Santanta Cup they come down and played Shelburne who were smashing side playing in the Europa League and all that time Pat Fenlon was the manager and um, Davy Jeffries brought Linfield down I remember meeting them afterwards they, they actually come down and beat Shelburne against all the odds so um one-off games, there's absolutely no problem. Irish League teams here could compete with League of Ireland teams, but can they get the consistency of mm-hmm. playing every week? But that full-time football does help. I think you see it now in the Irish League. Now you've got Lauren who do it properly. Yep. Train in the morning consistently. It's not sh- shadowed all over the place. Train here at ten or 7 o'clock at night. They do it properly. Mm-hmm. You've Crusaders here full-time. You've Glenn Torn here full-time. So I think... The gap's closing, maybe? Yeah, I think the gap's closing, and I think now, especially now's a good time for kids to start dreaming about being full-time footballers. When mm-hmm. you see an hour up the road, you could be playing full-time football there. Mm-hmm. So, no, it's... Listen, I wish it was 19 again. I wish it was 18 again, because not that we do things differently, but it's great to get another playing, being a full-time footballer. So we said earlier there, how how did you how did your body and all transition from part time to to full time? Then when you quit Shamrock Rovers, it was going from full time back to part time. Part time, yeah. How did you feel? Did you, did you feel that you had to do some extra work yourself? Were you willing to put that work yeah. in, or did you just Tuesday Thursday just see see how it goes? Uh, I think see, I missed the transfer deadline at that time. You come up here. Um, I couldn't say for any of the Premier teams because the transfer deadline was up. So the only thing I could go to was the Championship. So I went to Bangor. My mate, friend of the family, Jory Dunlop, who goalkeeper played for Northern Ireland Limpfield. He was manager there. So actually me and my brother Colin went there. Uh, had a great time. Um, I was playing centre forward, scoring plenty of goals. Really, really enjoyed it. I felt fit. I just let things, as you say there, I just trained Tuesday, Thursday. Um, but at down home here I was playing plenty of indoor football so I was looking after myself keep myself fit so I was there for a couple of months of challenging for the championship that time mm-hmm. um, and then when the transfer window opened again then Newry City off wanted me so that's when I went to Newry which was closer to home and um, I have all them years been travelling to Linfield to Yards to Glenlavin everywhere to, living down south at Shamrock Rovers eventually it was 15 minutes away from the house and it was yeah. Great time at Newry. I think that was the longest stint I had there a couple of years there. Mm-hmm. So, no, it was good. There was Paul Miller was, um, I think Paul Miller was manager at the time. He brought me in, but he was only there two weeks and then he went away to Glen Torn. He tried to bring me to Glen Torn with him, uh, but I refused. I just thought, look, I'm happy where I'm at. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get back playing, enjoying the football close to home. And, and there was a few years where I was playing really, really well, felt fit at Newry. Yeah, Newry um, would have been a, a well-established Premiership side yeah, then and, and a good were. side. Then Roy Coyle came in as manager as well there. Um, no, we, we, we were we were established side. We were challenging for the, the league. We had a good team, or, well, challenging for the top half of the league at least. Um, no, I enjoyed that there. I really did enjoy that time because, as I say, I was a wee bit more mature. I think that's maybe when the penny started to drop, when I was... I think it was nearly 30, 30 there when I really started to realise what I should be doing and what mm-hmm. I missed out in. Yeah. And then my, my Newry career had to come to an end because of my Achilles. I had sort of an Achilles problem that came, I think, from a calf injury earlier in my career. Mm-hmm. I kept getting tendonitis in my calf, so I couldn't have played more than 50 minutes of a game and it was flaring up and swelling. Mm-hmm. So, in that, so what happened was for most of the season I was sub and Jerry would have brought me on the 60th minute which I wasn't really enjoying because you always want to start games mm-hmm. but um, I really enjoyed Newry City good people there too so Newry was your last Irish league club yep yep it was and then I sort of went played local there mm-hmm. again the things I learnt playing local football I, I, I learnt so quick I started getting the coaches eye you hear maybe managers talking about when you're football you don't see things which you would do as a coach mm-hmm. so when I was, went down to local football and I started maybe taking a wee bit more responsibility as in trying to sort a team or organise a team or help the manager and take training sessions and started to enjoy it so I started getting that thing to talk about coaches eye and seeing things a different way mm-hmm. so 
the the uh, path I took there, I really, really have no regrets with that because, as I say, I learned so much. It got me in the coaching, got me in the managing, and I've seen all sides of football in this country from the top to the bottom, mm-hmm. and I'm still learning. I, I was at Al Long there not so long ago as a player. Um, after being a manager at Banbridge Rangers, and I'm still learning playing and managing on both eyes as a player and a, as a coach. So, um, no, I've, I've, I've definitely took a, a strange avenue towards everything I've done in my life as in football and then in the coaching. And uh, I've been up and down levels of football, back and forward. Um, but no, I've no, reg- I've no regrets as far as uh, going, going playing local football here. I really enjoyed everything. So when you started playing local football, did you kind of just have a more laid back approach? Were you just doing it for the enjoyment, maybe for the social side, or were you were you going with the same attitude as you were in your Ashley days? Yeah, I, I was. Uh, I tried to balance it. I was looking after myself. Thursdays, Fridays, I was believe it or not, I was eating healthy. Even at 40 years of age, I was eating healthy, trying to give myself every bit of advantage I could in playing mm-hmm. against who all these young boys I'm playing against. So, But when I went out in the pitch, I was free. I just didn't put myself under pressure to go and win games. I didn't beat myself up because before the last few years when I was playing for Alan Long, I was a manager at Banbridge Rangers and we were challenging for the league and we got beat, I think, maybe two game or two games to go before the end of the season and we lost the league by a point but the stress and the pressure of playing being a manager mm-hmm. player manager that whole season mm-hmm. if we dropped points I come home I was depressed couldn't talk to the family the whole family was suffering sat on the sofa watching TV didn't want to talk to anyone if we won a game I was thinking about the next game just coming down the road right Saturday we play this what way we would do this so it just t- took over my life I remember getting in touch with, with Ricky Forsyth he was on your your show a few weeks ago getting in touch with Ricky and I says Ricky I can't deal with this can't he's been at it 8 years or whatever and he's younger than me he's been an experienced manager and I remember saying Ricky I can't handle this here I, I'm telling you now that the stress I put myself under I need to win every game I can't accept anything else and he goes uh, you'll get over it Lee uh I remember his words was something like, "Believe it or not, you'll you'll get used to losing easier, or it'll make it easier for you, or something like that." Yeah. But then, um, I can see where he was coming from. I think towards the end, you can sort of see you can accept losing. Yeah. Well, you don't accept it, but your body, you can handle it a it's wee bit part better. Partial part of it. Partial of it. Some uh, sometimes hear managers over in England saying. They never get too excited when they win. Exactly. And they never get too down whenever they lose because they know there's a game coming. Yeah, yeah. In England, it's probably in another two or three days, but they know there's a game coming thick and fast that they can get back on. Exactly. You know, the winning trail or whatever. I used to say to my players, funny enough, when I was at Banbridge Rangers, we had a good time there. We finished second, got a couple, a few semi finals, but I remember saying to the boys, after they maybe won big games or celebrating the changing rooms, and I had to come in and go, look, settle down. Mm-hmm. Always stay grounded. Always stay grounded because if you get up in a high and you're winning, you're winning and you're celebrating afterwards, and you go and play the next game, you go one nil down. How do you react? You're 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 in a downer then. Mm-hmm. So what you should do is stay level grounded. Yes, deep inside, have a wee. Yes, enjoy that. We will win the day right on the next one. But I think you, I think I find it harder for players to react when they're getting beat if they celebrate too much when they're winning. Um, so I used to take, try and preach that into the boys and eventually they, they did accept it and they knew where I was coming from mm-hmm. I tried to say look we should, now you're in, a, you're in a zone now you should be used to winning so just win get it done get off the pitch mm-hmm. get changed go and have a wee beer whatever you're doing look after yourselves over the weekend back at it so um, no I think that's important and I can see where the managers are coming from about staying grounded with another focus now after this game mm-hmm.